Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Barnyards and Backyards Live. I'm Jeff Edwards from University of Wyoming Extension. My co-host today, as always, is Jeremiah Vardaman. Good morning, Jeremiah. Morning, Jeff. How are we doing? Good. It's an interesting day. It's uh, it's hat day, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> and not making fun of you, Scott, it just happened to be that uh, today's the day. <laughs> um, our our uh, other host is uh, Jenny Thompson, who helps us keep the show running. Uh, you may not hear her, but or excuse me, you may not see her, but you may hear her. Uh, she does ask questions and pull things forward for us if we need to. And our guest today is Scott Cotton. He's an extension educator from uh, Natrona County. And uh, our topic today, make sure I get this correct, is uh, having a plan for your livestock in the face of disaster. So uh, good morning, Scott. How are you today? Good morning. How are you? Doing well. Glad to have you with us today. Um, uh, before we get started, those of you who are new to Zoom, if you have a question for Scott or for any of us, if you would like, uh, if you take your cursor and scroll over the face of uh, the Zoom file, you'll see at the bottom a Q&A or a chat box. If you have a question for us, type your questions into either of those. If you are joining us via Zoom, if you have a question there, please, excuse me, Facebook, that other platform. <laughs> um, <laughs> If you have a question there, uh, Jenny will be monitoring Facebook and uh, just uh, write your question or type your chat question in the uh, comment box and uh, we'll pull that forward and get it asked of Scott or one of us and we'll take care of it. So um, I think I got everything correct. I think uh, so. I, yeah, these have been really well received. We've done a lot of these kind of virtual formats for different topics, different venues, and the best ones are just when people are really engaging and bring those questions forward. So make sure to write that in the chat box, Q&A box, Facebook, wherever you're joining us from, right? And we'll bring that forward. Yeah, and just reviewing Scott's slides this morning made me think about some things. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll definitely have some questions. So <laughs> without further ado, Scott, <laughs> Please continue. Well, maybe not questions, but maybe some smart out comments too. So we'll get to <laughs> I'm afraid to ask what Jeff's questions are. I'm no, please continue. Uh, so good morning. I'm going to talk about having a plan, a disaster plan for livestock, and it'll be different scales, some on a local level, just around a house and and some for ag producers with uh, numbers of animals and the principles are basically the same. So if it's okay, I'll share a screen and we'll get started. All right, can you guys see that? Yep, looks good. Yeah, it's good. All right, this is just a picture of a wildfire with a, a person trying to set a backfire in front of it. And I am not in slide mode. Oh, here it is, all right. So if you have questions, jump in here and, and just ask right off the top. We've been working, Extension's been working with emergency managers and these issues for almost a hundred years. So we have a lot of experience across the United States with wildfires, almost every type of disaster, so. Scott, this is one of the things that, you know, we, we don't really think about until we need it, right? Uh, so. We hope you do. We well, well, yeah, but. It's, it's hard to be prepared ahead of time. And then you think about it afterwards and say, oh yeah, okay, I should have paid attention to that presentation. Yeah. Well, the, the big thing is there's, there's four parts to the disaster. There's uh, preparedness, response, recovery. And then the one that we've added in the last 60 years we call mitigation. And that's those things that you can do to reduce the impact if you ever get impacted by some type of disaster. And that's all about planning. It's all about knowing your risk. And we'll talk about that a little bit. So what happens in disasters? One of the preconceptions of people, especially with animals that we care about is that there'll be all kinds of help available. And, and you need to remember that emergency officials are gonna send the bulk of their resources to cover people first. Life safety is what we call it. So. Uh, even if you have fire teams and deputy sheriffs and state troopers and helicopters and you name it, they're going to check on the life safety per first and make sure people are safe first. And we want you to do that too. Uh, so people first, animals second, property third. 
uh, once they're sure everybody's safe and they have resources left over, uh, they'll help address some of these things. So we actually have subsets of plans on every county emergency plan called annexes and the ESF 11 is Ag and Natural Resources. The problem is on big events uh, or multi-day events that some of these resources will be expired or they have to take time out. Uh, so the resources, even though they're done with life safety, may not be real available at first. So we got to plan ahead and do it ourselves to a certain degree. That doesn't mean that we want you to self-deploy without a plan. Uh, so planning ahead for animals can mitigate the risk during disasters. That's the bottom line. Uh, to save livestock, you're going to need some basic elements. Uh, and you, these probably are intuitive. If you think about it. they're going to have to have shelter needs. Uh, that includes if you're going to put them in a shelter, make sure it's durable. Don't um, don't chase all your livestock into a log barn when there's a fire coming over the hill. I mean, it's some common sense. But if you have one that's fire resistant, it may be an option for you. Um, push them to low impact zones. If, if it's a forest fire and you have a big grass meadow with low grass and you've developed a buffer around it by grazing around it hard, push them out there. They got a better chance. Uh, then take care of yourself. Um, if necessary, we evacuate. Um, and it, we're working on more teams all the time across the United States. So it's important to understand that. You can always get involved with that effort. Uh, talk to your local county emergency manager. So then they're gonna need water. And, and this is a big thing with drought and it's a big thing with wildfire. And it's also a big thing in the winter. Drought is just a lack of available water. And in super cold temperatures with uh, like where they're pushing hay out of this helicopter, we pushed hay out and then we realized we had to go along about every mile and a half and chop water holes in the river mm. because they, without the water, even in the winter, they're, they're hard pressed. Um, so water needs are important. Uh, then feed, of course. Um, some trivia, a uh, Black Hawk helicopter only carries 24 bales. It makes two runs. <laughs> it makes two runs and then it has to refuel. Um, so not, even though it's a great photo op for the governors and the dignitaries to push hay out of the Blackhawk, it is not a functional livestock response tool. Efficiency uh, at its best. <laughs> and we'll sh I'll show you some other options later, but we found it's actually in blizzards, it's actually better to hook a DA cat onto the front of a hay semi and drag it out in the snow and just toss, toss off 25 tons, you know. So it, it, when you're looking at resources, carefully evaluate what really works. Um, and then those resources are important and resources to save livestock are something we need to think about because if you bought horses and they're at your property but you don't have a way to move them, uh, you're in a bind. Yeah. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later but the reality is you have to think about worst case scenario, what do I have to do? Uh, if you're raising seed stock bulls and a real high dollar bulls, you might consider developing a safe area for them in case of flood, fire, blizzard or something like that, because you had a lot of your wherewithal can go right down the tube. So, well, and when you're talking about this, Scott, as you're going through all these items, right, it, it pertains to every situation. But in every situation, it's going to be unique and different to that situation, to that operation, to the time of year, right? Am I thinking of that correctly? You're right on target. And my, my wife is great at that. She plans for disasters with me every day. <laughs> As she should. That's, that's the best way to have it is have somebody, you know, and you can assign this to somebody who's interested in, in, in a family or on an operation. And they can be your, your mitigation planner and think about little tweaks in your operation that can make a big difference in the future, whether you're just a small acreage owner with five horses on 40 acres or whether you're, um, you own 5,000 head of cattle at, at the same principles, just as you indicated. So, well, and, and Scott, and I don't, I don't want to jump ahead in your presentation if you're going to cover it, but there's a se seasonality to our disasters, generally speaking, not always, right? Um, maybe we should back up a little bit. What's the difference between a disaster and an emergency? Probably an emergency is something that that's going wrong, but we can address and have the resources to uh, to address it. Maybe a disaster is when uh, our resources are stretched or or exceeded. Maybe I guess is how I'd look at it. Right on target. Uh, when 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 you have numerous factors that exceed your capability to respond, 
that's a disaster. Um, when you have an emergency, it's when you have a problem, but there's resources coming available, and you know it's going to get an impact, but you can turn around and deal with it. So uh, several emergencies often make a disaster, right? Or uh, it's, it's kind of simple, but um, the bigger the impact, the more likely it'll be a disaster because you'll suck up those resources. Now, to save livestock, you need documentation. We've had a lot of people move, transfer, evacuate livestock, get outside of a control barrier where law enforcement is blocking roads and have no proof of ownership. Uh, so when they come to a shelter or something like that, they put them off to the side and say, well, you know, you need to find, you need to have documentation. Uh, well, if your, your farmhouse just burned up where all your paperwork was, that's not a good idea. And we'll talk about that when we get to the kit discussion yep. about a disaster kit. Okay, here's some examples to give you guys a different feel for things, winter blizzards and stuff like this. The top left picture is uh, some pigs in the water uh, at Hurricane Floyd, 1992 in North Carolina, where I really got started in this. Um, we actually sent, uh, we're trying to figure out how to deal with this and we had some fishermen come by the post, the, the command post and wanted to help. And uh, they self wanted to self deploy and the uh, incident commander said, we'll get to you in just a minute. And they, they finally got frustrated and motored upstream. And then about 30 minutes later, one of the boats came floating downstream without any person in it, but uh, there was two pigs in the boat and it was idling downstream without the operator. So we sent boats upstream and found most of the pigs, the water had gone up about another 20 feet. Most of the pigs were on top of the roof with the other fishermen uh, suspended on the roof. So it, it, there's a technique to this and it isn't always the same. The next picture to the right. Uh, it, it's I, easier to catch fish than it is a pig. Oh. <laughs> Especially in a boat. <laughs> they're nervous. You push them into a boat that wobbles and they, they don't feel comfortable with it. And they're very vociferous. You know, they'd like to make a lot of complaint. And to be honest, people, some people say pigs are smarter than us and there is some rationale to that in disasters. So um, the picture on the right um, is from Puerto Rico um, in 2017 when we dealt with uh, the Hurricane Maria wiping out uh, Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. And I put that picture in there for one simple reason. We're going to talk about evacuation routes. Um, but no matter what you plan, that road might not be in place. So um, evacuation routes have to be flexible. Uh, the bottom one uh, is from... Um, 2002 Hayman fire in Colorado, where we had to open up extension, opened up five different shelters to take animals in from seven counties. And we had horses like this when we're perfectly happy stand at the state fairgrounds. We had other horses that were wild, untrained, that uh, literally tried to jump through the windows on stalls because they were unfamiliar with things. So there's a lot of factors come into this and handling is one of those. We'll talk about that. Some blizzard realities. Um, we get blizzards, and and Jeremiah, you mentioned there's a seasonality to it. So, I'm going to bait you and Jeff a little bit, or anybody else. Uh, when do you think we have the worst blizzards? I'd March. say April or May. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, Depends on the criteria, I suppose. <laughs> well, if you think about it, um, the worst ones on record that we have in the West, because we're used to them. Um, is when they're really late spring or really early fall. After we get to October on through about March, we're kind of braced for them, right? We're feeding for them, our equipment's ready, our cattle and our horses are in locations that we know they'll have a little shelter. But if you have one, say the first week of September, when everything still has summer hair on it, maybe on summer pasture, and like winter storm Adam that came in at the end of September, early October, it came in with 96 inches of snow between Deadwood and Shadron, Nebraska in two days. And then the wind blew. Yeah, and then the wind blew and, and we had cattle out on summer pasture, sheep <clears throat> out on summer pasture, and then you block up the roads and then when it starts melting, that country up there is gumbo country. So uh, you had to have tracked vehicles to go out and check things or an aircraft. It got really bad. Um, but some blizzard realities, there's different dynamics with the animals. Horses tend to go upwind or to shelter that they know of and then they'll turn the rear end to a storm. Uh, in tornadoes, we've seen them go into barns and then the hail would drive them out from the noise. 
cattle and sheep tend to go downwind um, until they hit a fence or they're trapped, or as in the 97 blizzard in Colorado, they went down into waterways and the wind was lower there, so they stayed there. And then like Winter Storm Adam and that storm down there, which we was before we named storms, um, the lens of the drifting snow blew over them. And actually we had about, in those two storms, we had about 700 head of cattle that it sealed over the top of them, they asphyxiated. Uh, down, so standing in the water up to their knees with a snow crown over top of them. In most cases, it's just hypothermia, but in some cases they can get trapped. So be careful where your layout is. If you see that wind pushing them to a bad spot or you know that intuitively on your landscape, channel them sideways or something. We have seen cattle move as far as 65 miles in front of a storm, um, drifted all the way from north of Lamar down to Springfield, Colorado. The picture on the right is one of those cattle that got halfway and then passed away in a snowstorm. Um, and pigs, um, like I said, they kind of do what they want to. Um, so you never know. It just, uh, I think there's a lead pig out there that passes the word and they all come do what the pig wants. <laughs> the smartest one. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. the canoe problem. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. know, if, if, you, uh, if you're a pig and you got into a boat and the fisherman got out, I would say that you're smarter than the fisherman. <laughs> well, I'm not arguing that at all. Uh, <laughs> we, do, we are appreciative of people that step up and offer to help. We just would like them to be with a trained leader, team leader that can say, no, no, don't do that. Let's, uh, let's take a couple steps here first. Uh, and I, I know you guys have both worked county fairs, so you know what it sounds like when you get a bunch of pigs moving along through each other. Um, and if they get distressed, and we'll talk about distressed animals in a minute, if they get distressed, it's uh, it's interesting and you need earplugs. Well, and probably one more point back with uh, what you're talking about on blizzards, Scott, is it, I think what you're capturing a little bit, or at least what I heard in the fall and spring, you know, we get heavy, wet snows, right? It can really accumulate quickly. We might not be ready for it in terms of preparation with our resources or uh, like in the springtime, maybe maybe about now we're running a little low on our hay supplies because this is usually when we're going out to pasture. But we also have those other adverse effects, right, of those time periods and depending on when it is. But it might be really warm and mild, right, 30, 35 degrees, but we're getting lots of snow. It's slushy. It's wet. It's, you know, hard to get places. Or it's the opposite, you know, December or we're just coming out of it, right? Negative temperatures, it's hard to keep water uh, from freezing, right? To keep those animals with some, some resources. But I guess what I'm trying to say is those, those resource needs are gonna change and evolve with every circumstance. And, that, and that's what you're trying to say is, re it's not a one-time plan, right? Well, it's not, and, and you're very accurate. Um... Uh, on our barnyards and backyards website, you can find some articles and stuff from the magazine about stacking the hay high and dry in several places and, and other materials that we've worked up as a group there. Because the fact is that if you're in an area that has blizzards intermittently, it's a pain in the neck to stack hay two different places or three different places. But having that little five, six day stack of hay up where the wind will blow it clear that's close to where your cattle will be or your horses will be or your sheep will be can make the difference between survival and not because you can snowshoe up there if you have to and just feed them off the stack you know but you can't move a bunch of hay up out of the bottom in the middle of a snowstorm or a flood or anything else that goes for drought too if you've got a pasture that you're reserved off to the side just in case you have a disaster uh, like a drought the nasty snaky drought disaster um, it's important to have that emergency resource where you can get to it. Um, uh, on the average, if you look at our stats uh, in the West, 5.7 years out of every 10, a number of counties in each of the Western states has drought. So 57% of the time, uh, so you need to plan for it. You just need to plan for it. Uh, Optimism is great, it's what keeps ag running, but you need to plan for the worst case scenario. So uh, very accurate. Thank you, Jeremiah. So let's talk about some wildfire. Here's some black Angus cows from one of my neighbors over at the Spotted Tail Fire in 2006 in Nebraska. Um, 
cattle often don't move in front of fires. In fact, sometimes we have to send teams out to move them in front of fires. Um, the interesting part of that is if something like an ember hits their back, a burning ember that which the fires will carry up to a mile up to two miles, depending on the fire. Uh, then they hit three or four cattle in that herd. And the next thing you know, it's like light in their tail. They're on the run. And they don't necessarily run to where they need to go to. They may run right down into the track of the fire, which is an important reason to know what's going on with an incident and which direction it's moving and how fast it's moving. How fast does a fire run? A great, let's say a range fire. How fast does a range fire run, Jeff? Fast as the wind's blowing. Very good. Uh, so, <laughs> so we're talking anywhere from two miles an hour to 33 miles an hour, right? So a group of cattle doesn't usually move more than about 10, 12 miles an hour, even under duress. So the fire's gonna outrun them. It can circle them, trap them. Um, it's just, uh, you need to plan ahead, have a couple outs for them. Um, horses, uh, very sensitive, and, and Jeff and I have talked about this, the fact that they, they can hear the roar of the fire. They can smell the smoke. And then if they're worse if embers get on them, but even before they've been impacted, they could be 10 miles away and panic. Um, and sometimes they'll run right into the incident, um, which is a big challenge for firefighting teams. Uh, we have some uh, long history about teaching firefighters how to take livestock marker crayon and mark the address on a horse if they can catch them and then just turn them loose. Mm -hmm. Now, horses are great about looking for a spot to get away from things. So uh, we have a, a whole number of cases where horses would find that one patch that wasn't on fire and they'd go stand in it. And then you'd come back and 80% of the landscape be gone, the horse would be standing in that one patch. Even if it was an island, you know, they, they'd find it. They're pretty, they're mobile and they're sensitive. So they, they, they may run around six times before they get there, but they're, they're better off. Uh, when we're talking about that, let's always remember, if you buy horses that are untrained or uh, untrailerable or something like that, you're placing a big workload on yourself and on emergency teams when they come in. Well, and probably a part of that, Scott, is having the right size trailer right so if i have just a little two horse bumper pole and i got 20 horses to move man that's you know that's 10 trips just to get everybody out of there so trying to trying yes. to make that realistic doesn't mean you have to haul all 20 horses in the one load but just efficiency and the last ones might not make it <laughs> well addressed oh we gotta think positive we gotta oh i'm sorry <laughs> uh, be selective uh, so but we'll talk about a little bit of those things uh, in a few minutes here. Sheep seem to sense and move away from fires, but even with that, with sagebrush step and range fires, often that fire can outrun them. Um, but they, the nice part about, you can use overgrazing to make fire buffers, and I've spoken on that nationally. If you know where your dominant winds come from and you know where your fire risk usually is, you can go through and overgraze bands every couple of miles and make fire breaks. And, Firefighters love you for that because they can get ahead of that fire. And it's a whole lot easier to fight an 18 inch fire than it is a 30 foot wall of flame. And when it hits that overgrazed area or a road next to an overgrazed area, you've just made this 100 yard fire break that they can, they got a chance to fight it right there. If, they, and if you're going to do that, talk to your fire captains and, and let them know that, hey, I'm going to try to manage my grass like that right there. And, and keep it low, or go back in and plant low growing grass afterwards. But sheep seem to move away from stuff. Now blizzards, they, it's kind of a, they'll tolerate blizzards, they deal with them. And then when they gets to an overwhelming point, they just, they're totally at a loss. So some flood realities. Um, most livestock, just like people, um, want to move uphill out of the flood. And uphill isn't always the safe direction of the, now, uh, Anthony Vestal at Texas A&M, when I worked together a lot on this stuff, and he says, you're lucky. Your floods go downhill, tear a new canyon, and they're gone. You can move away from them. He said, with me in Texas and Oklahoma down here on the hurricane belt, I got 10, 12, 30 feet of water over 100 counties. There's nowhere to go. So, yeah. But they still look for that uphill ground. And uh, so uh, just understand they're going to move that direction. Um, uh, even if it traps them or isolates them. And that's, that's the issue. If, if you know which way is uphill, you'll have an idea of which way they're gonna go. Um, 
the, the comment pliers, pliers, pliers was uh, trying to tell the firefighters and the boat teams that they need to have wire pliers on them when they go out there and there's uh, 200 cattle like this trapped against the fence line that there may be an uphill out 100 yards away, they can cut that fence. Uh, they don't usually carry that equipment, but we cross train now uh, and it's important. Uh, ranchers and farmers are, if I had my choice, I'd put a rancher or farmer in every rescue boat and every rural fire engine, just for good measure. <laughs> now, it, to be honest, most of the rural fire departments are made up of landowners like that. So they're pretty intuitive. But cutting fence with a bolt cutter isn't near as quick as with a pair of fence and pliers. So think about what equipment you might need in, in worst comes cases. Uh, cattle can knock boats and canoes over. Uh, um, they Sometimes they just don't like it coming up against them. So you try to herd cattle in a water flood with uh, boats. Um, it can get interesting because some of them are a little distressed in the first place. Uh, now pigs, like we talked about pigs, Will, uh, they want to get high and dry. And if you come up with a boat, they, they may want in the boat. You try to force them and they may want not. Uh, but they have a tendency to, to, to get it a little aggressive. So, so in Wyoming, when we're dealing with livestock planning for disasters, we, we go from hot to cold to dry to everything in between. Um, a couple of years ago, we dealt with a canal failure down with Jeff. And then we turned around to like eight days later and had a tornado walk right to the same area and uh, tried to track the damage of the tornadoes. Uh, tornadoes are much like earthquakes. Animals can sense the disturbance, try to move away from it, but they can get confused. So that wasn't in this presentation originally. But uh, The left picture is a wildfire, of course. Uh, the right picture is one of the uh, central Nebraska, a little urban or rural airport that got overwhelmed with ice. So what to do? Um, uh, the number one thing is to know your risk. Know what uh, types of incidents can slap you and which ones are going to hit you the hardest. Uh, if you talk to the senior citizens in the community, they can tell you exactly what happened. And it may not happen in your lifetime, but being ready can make a difference and fit it stay in business. Um, this is a nasty statistic, but on national ag incidents to disasters, 42% or better of, life, of ag operations that are impacted by disaster, either change ownership, change management, or go out of business if they're not ready. Uh, so it, that's huge. I mean, it's terrible, uh, but there's nothing like uh, having your entire flock killed with a blizzard and then have to call the banker and say, you know, I know I still owe 30% on those, but uh, they're gone. And the bankers are one of the elements we work with right after a disaster. Look for forgiveness, look for options, look for everything. And then we work with stress uh, because these incidents will stress everybody. So you need to know your risk. Talk to your family and your neighbors and your friends about if we have this, what, what do we do? Talk to the emergency management groups, firefighters, the law enforcement. Every county has an emergency manager that love getting into these conversations because they have additional resources that if they know who you are when you call, when the balloon goes up, they may answer your call if that's already on their phone where they might not answer blind calls. So it's important to talk to them. Um, listen to the news. Um, uh, news can get iffy. Uh, your cell phones that we're also addicted to uh, the, the top picture right there took out four sets of cell towers. Uh, cell phones can go down in disasters. And even if they don't, within minutes, they tend to get overloaded. The towers will get overloaded with panic calls. So it's really handy to talk to people ahead of time and keep your cell phone and your cell phone charger um, um, available. Uh, make sure you have the options, but we, we still stand by with uh, regular radios uh, when we get into rural disasters because they aren't dependent all the time on that cell tower. Uh, have a kit, have a plan and practice it. The bottom left picture is from a drought in, two, in 2000, Southeast Colorado. Uh, we did have a couple wildfires there, but uh, give you an idea, they have a lower precip rating than you do up here. Uh, they run seven to 14 inches a year. In that year, we had our first rain in that region of about 10 counties. And the first rain kept September 4th. 
um, the last and the grass was already dried out. Uh, and our last rain was September 21st. Well, and Scott, uh, talking about that, I guess from my observations, my experience that I've seen is a lot of times when I see a lot of drought, uh, on the back end of that drought, a lot of times I'll see a lot of flooding come right behind it, right? So once, once the moisture does break and it, it does start coming, uh, that ground is just so dry and, and a lot of times for, and I don't know why this is, but it, that moisture tends to come in a little bit larger dosage, right? A little bit more volume or amount and, and the ground and the vegetation is not there to hold the, the soil. And so we see flooding, we see mudslides, we, we see that other extreme. And so you can quickly switch from one, one emergency or disaster into another and uh, it'd be caught. So you mentioned earlier, there's some cycles and there's some patterns too. Like here's one we know really well. So you have a drought year and uh, it disturbs the plant community stability. As you indicated, it opens up inner space and then we get, we get a year where the early spring moisture is really good. And we get all these invasive annual grasses and then they dry out early. And those two things, if you add them together, just put an equal sign behind them and put wildfire behind it because the minute the degree stays and that dries out, you get all that stuff that goes from being grass and turns into flash fuel, you've got a wildfire season. There's just no way around it. The rural firefighters uh, are very keyed into this. I'm about to fact of early abnormally high precept that stops uh, before June because they know that all that early growth is going to just turn into flash fuel and they got issues. Uh, so there's some management tools, range management tools that we can talk to you some other time about watching that pattern and, and making those fire breaks and stuff like that. But it is a critical issue because um, we have about four to five times the range fires every year in the United States that we do forest fires. Most of the injuries and deaths that we have in the United States for the last 45 years are related to range fires, not forest fires, but the media likes to highlight the forest fires. I mean, it's not jazzy to go out on the ground like on the bottom picture and take firefighting pictures, you know, because it's an issue. The second factor we run into is ag producers. We're working really hard to train them to fight fires from the black side from where it burned rather than getting in front of the fire and fighting it from the brown because it overwhelms them. The smoke and the gases and the, the flame height can overwhelm them. We see a lot of a real sad things. And you saw that in Kansas a couple of years ago where people sent young couples out uh, to try to move cattle in front of the fire. And you need a margin. You need somebody that understands wildfire really well before you do that because you're putting people at risk. So cattle still are not, and horses still are not as important as the life safety of people. Something to remember. Have a kit and uh, have a plan and practice your plan uh, we have several ranches that kind of make it a, a annual thing, you know, like September. Let's talk to our planning for the year, our emergency plans. So this is a kit with some, uh, and we do have some other ones. There's a red line up here under the top of a livestock disaster kit, and that is the goal is to be move, able to move things, everything other than a herd in one hour. Um, there's some challenges with that. And when I worked with the national group of equine specialists on the same material, they were really shocked looking at some of the statistics because they figured that turns out that out of 41 state equine specialists, only three of them had enough trailer capacity to haul the horses they day on. So you load up, let's say you got a four horse trailer, which is pretty good size. You load up four horses, you track out to a dis destination point, and you head back to the house and what happens? There's a state trooper parked on the highway that says, sorry, you can't go in there. Can't go back in to get whatever else you need. Yeah. Unless you have a radio and you're part of a response team, you cannot go back in there. So you're gonna have a limited opportunity to get in and out, in and out. So you need a plan. You need those ownership papers. And we encourage people, and I've, uh, we've got several fact sheets in the process right now and shared them with Jenny. I don't know if she can post them, but when you're doing livestock evacuation, you need to take your photocopies and never hurts to have your ID photocopied 
and your horse ownership and your your brand certificate and your deed and a few other things like that. Make photocopies, seal them in an envelope, put them inside your horse trailer or inside your truck and just make them secure. Uh, worst comes to worst, you can update them. Um, but if you don't have them, uh, then it's gonna have to draw witnesses to prove that you own things. And that takes a lot of time. If you can just present the papers when you hit a shelter, then they, they can document it. Brand inspector can look at it, veterinarian can look at it and say, yep, you're good. This is who the animals they are. They own them, you're good. Uh, photos work really well. With horses, take, take photo of each side and the front. If they have significant markings, take the rear too, but put them with those ownership papers. Um, vaccination records for pets, livestock dogs, guard dogs, uh, horses, uh, it's really important when you come into a shelter or, or a, a destination site to have those. Uh, have a contact book. Remember I just said, don't always count on your cell phone. Um, it may go down. Uh, so have a printout of uh, your vet, your, your neighbors, your family, other things. If, if something happens to you, other people can find out and make some calls. It's important. Uh, have some money. Um, power goes down. Some of these disasters, there's no power. During Puerto Rico, it was all cash. Uh, prices on food went up to $1,800 a week per person. Um, uh, housing was non-existent. So take your own blue tarp and cot with you. Um, uh, if you have vehicles you're running, make sure your tires and your spare tires are in good shape because you may not have access to them. Uh, we always encourage people to put some comfort items like bedrolls, chairs, go mugs, uh, you name it, some dried food, MREs, whatever in the trailer too. Uh, and we don't. We know people can't haul a lot of feed, but it never hurts to have a day's worth for horses, especially a little grain, some cake, or uh, some hay strapped on top of the trailer. And manpower, especially if you're going to have to make several trips, have some people you can call to help. Uh, buckets and hoses, um, good idea. Feed. I mentioned it again because it never hurts to have the feed for them and for you. Don't forget your stock dogs. Um, uh, some vet supplies of uh, horses and cattle and dogs can get injured during these events. So have some first aid supplies for both you and them. Uh, spare fuel is an iffy thing. Um, it's not such a big deal during drought and blizzard to carry some, but in a wildfire, you always wanna make sure it's stored safely. Um, we encourage people to put a clothing change in or at least three layers, a waterproof layer, a thermal layer, and a change that you can relax in because that may be all the clothes you have for a week so just think it out. Uh, I, uh, and a number of us that do this on a regular basis, carry three or four portable panels, like a lot of the rodeo teams, they strap to their trailer. Uh, worst comes to worst, you get somewhere and there's no space, at least you can let your animals out and in and out. They can stand on solid ground. Uh, towels, um, people say, well, I can, I can just manage and clean myself. The towel isn't for us. Um, the, 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 the amazing part is, especially with wildfires, it, animals are really distressed. If you take a damp towel and wipe out their eyes, wipe out their nostrils and their mouth if necessary, they calm down. It's one of those little tricks. Uh, they calm down, especially horses, uh, dogs too. Uh, take a, a solar, I love those solar wind up radios, but with batteries too and flashlights, but they have the new ones that are both a flashlight, a radio, and it'll charge your phone. And you can either do it by cranking it since you're just sitting there at a fairgrounds with your horses, you know, you can crank for three minutes, charge your phone, or you can put it out in the sun and it charges up like that. And then you've got all three things, communication, news, flashlight, and a power charger. It's a good idea. Think about what you might need. Um, and Jenny, I sent you a thing with a go bag fact sheet. Is there a way we can share that stuff? Yes, I, once we post up the um, video this afternoon, and usually it's up by three, we'll also post links to all the um, handouts that you gave us. Okay, great. So the plan, let's talk about the plan. Um, everybody's plan is different. Uh, the first bullet there is know where your marked livestock are. Why do I say that? So you know where to get them and what where you're, it, your routes of entry to go find them and 
what you need to get there or whatever. Are they in the back hills or are they in the corral? I mean, that's two different ways of retrieval, I guess, is how I'd look at it, Scott. Why did I say marked? Well, ownership. <laughs> well, you know, when we did the Heyman fire on day three, we actually uh, armed about 80 firefighters with livestock crayons because they were, we had catch teams down the bottom of the draws for horses. And, but the horse comes running down there and it's, there's seven white horses, right? After you get to the bottom. Uh, so finally, they just got to the point where they'd marked the 105 Alpine Drive on the horse's side. When it came down the hill, we knew we could ride it down. You know, somebody says, my horse is missing. And you can say, well, where was it? Well, it was on Alpine Drive. Oh, that's in Penn C. All, all the ones from that upper part are in Penn C. The other factor that's sad is during disasters, both blizzards and wildfires and hurricanes, we've seen theft where people knew that there was high dollar animals in there and they'd go in and pick them up and take them out of state and sell them. So uh, radio chips or brands or uh, whatever you can to make sure you're, especially high dollar animals are marked. Um, and if you're uh, tattoos, whatever you prefer, uh, but it's really important to prove ownership. It's really important to track. And the, out of the 14 horses we've had stolen expensive like 40,000 and more horses Ooh. that were stolen out of the Heyman fire coming off the mountain. On, there's eight highways on. We managed to get 12 of them back by doing a little bit of camera review on the highway patrol cameras and then have an ID. And they ended up in New Mexico and Arizona, mm. a whole state, two states away, but we could track them. So knowing what and where the impact is a big part of the plan uh, it, don't run south if the impact's wrapped all the way around you. It's just, you need to know that you're going the right direction. And you need to give an estimate of how fast it's going to get you, how much time we have before it comes to you. You know, if we have a blizzard coming in and it's uh, half an inch an hour, you can plan things out. If it's 96 inches in a day, you may not have the same amount of time. So just plan ahead. Two possible evacuation routes and destinations. Uh, the bottom picture on the right is in Shadron, a, an animal shelter I ran after the Region 23 fire complex. And um, there's issues with the destinations. So your horse may be mixed in with a lot of other horses. We always have what we call disaster poles, where horses will be bored together just because of the limited pen space somebody gets amorous with somebody else's horse and then 11 months later you have a foal that somebody didn't want or maybe they did want, I don't know. But um, there's just because you have a fairgrounds doesn't mean they can handle every animal in the, in the, in the county. So have your equipment ready, uh, have some supplies ready, contact somebody with your plan. Um, if you have a relative uh, 10 to 20 miles away, let them know if you have a blizzard or if you have a wildfire what you're thinking of doing so that when you go off grid and your phone doesn't ring and they don't know where you are and the emergency manager says, well, what do you think they would do? Somebody can say, here's their general thought process about how to deal with it. Here's where they were going to head first. It's a good to share your plan. Uh, get manpower. Um, have capable manpower. And if you don't have it, have a list of people you can call. I can't tell you how many times we've used 4-H superintendents and club volunteers that are already screened that we trained a little bit to come in and help us evacuate animals from in front of disasters. They're amazing. Our volunteers are just amazing. And they're trained. Most of them are very knowledgeable about handling livestock. But even with that, when you have livestock under duress, most people aren't used to dealing with it. Uh, your favorite horse that rears up and tries to take knock your head off. Um, cattle that just can't be herded. Uh, sheep that just circle on you. Um, stock dogs that they're already distressed and they are not letting you in out of your truck. You know, that's why we kind of lean on people like veterinarians, uh, rodeo contractors, and trained uh, animal responders for those real bad situations because they're used to dealing with it. They have a little different technique and they're ready, they watch and they're alert for those really panic attack kind of approaches. But always take care of yourself. 
it's got to be part of your plan. Take care of yourself. Don't put you in, you know, a, a, a injured or dead rescuer saves no animals. That's all there is to it. Doesn't work. Without you, uh, it, it, the animals are in worse shape. So take care of yourself first. Don't drive into risk without people knowing where you're going and that you have plans and the equipment to deal with the risk. Uh, the bottom line on this slide is open select gates. If you have a number of animals and you take the ones that are your best or most favored or whatever, load them up and you realize there's a fire coming over the hill south of us, open the gates that you think may have let the ones you have to leave behind have a chance. Open them to the neighbors, open them to the, your south pasture, whatever, uh, to the river edge. Um, we can find them and get them back if they're alive, but they've got to be able to self determine where the safest place is for them. So don't leave them trapped unless it's a safe spot. Open some gates. Um, Highway Patrol is really good at this. <laughs> We've had a lot of disease transmission and a lot of herd interbreeding because they said, well, let them out of there and just put them across the road, you know? Okay, well, they're alive, but uh, then, then they'll drive off and say, okay, you guys figure out who's is who's and how to get them back because the uh, disaster's over and our ship's over and no offense to them guys, I was one of them for a while, but uh, the reality is if any option is good as long as they're safe even if they have to move down a county road for 20 miles. It's a better option than being caught. Yeah, I, uh, oh, I had some family members, um, some relatives last summer had, were up there in those fires up in Montana, southern Montana, and they were picking up livestock. They were trailing. They were on the trail for five or six days just behind cattle, and they're moving cattle out of the way of the fire, and they just picked up any stock that they came across, and they just kept everybody moving. And they had rendezvous points and people brought food to them and <clears throat> just kept leapfrogging it. And they, they had a situation where one, one producer was like, why do you have my cattle? And they, they didn't understand what was kind of really going on. But once they figured everything out, they were really appreciative of, of the service and help because the animals were at least alive at the end of the day. So. so, and it takes a lot of creativity to go find them after the blizzard passes or the wildfire passes and, Never forget the resources you've got. The first time I ever really understood what it's like to be with a uh, aerial crop sprayer was that 97 winter storm when three of us got in with those crop sprayers to go look for herds of cattle. Um, those guys are a little bit scary. <laughs> You're sitting in that other seat and they'll go from 5,000 feet down to 100 feet off the ground and nothing flat. And they do it every day. So they don't think you think about it, but you're back there trying to keep your lunch, you know. At the same time, after the winter storm Adam up in um, South Dakota and Nebraska, it took us eight weeks of coordinating teams to find other cattle. What do you think the last ones we hauled back was? What type of animal? Pigs. No, we didn't have a lot of pigs. Thank goodness. <laughs> they would have been though. <laughs> they would have been. Bulls. Bulls. They're already agitated and they're spread across the landscape. Clean up into the Oglala Lakota Reservation and so we, we'd identify where there was and we, you know, one, one or two people can take a herd of cows and push them back. When you go after five bulls that are irritated, uh, it takes a little bit more equipment and manpower. So we were careful. And then we did have one situation where I drove in and there was a report of a cow um, and I won't say where it was, it was not in Nebraska. And when I drove in there, the elderly lady had a carcass hanging in her tree, uh, but said she hadn't seen a cow. And I just said, okay, and we write it off. It's <laughs> storm kill, right? That's storm kill. When it happened to drive into somewhere where it was trapped, right? Uh, so uh, let's drift on a little bit here so we don't run out of time. Manpower takes different shapes. If you have to move hay with helicopters, here's the beastie. You can roll about five or six round bales into a Chinook. And you can also do it in a C-130. We've done that. Uh, the, the interesting part, here's a trivia question. Do you cut the strings before you throw it out or not? I would say yes, but you know, it's a gamble. <laughs> it's, it's the interesting part, if you're, if you're in a C-130 and you're doing 120 to 150 miles an hour, you don't need to. It will just explode once the wind pressure hits it. If you're in these helicopters, you better grab the, the string 
and uh, listen to the guy in the helicopter when he says, make sure your harness is hooked into the wall. Because when the bell starts to roll and you're trying to pull the string or the net wrap off of it, it has a tendency to want to pull you out the back with it. So please listen to the usually National Guard pilots and, and crew chief when they're helping you. And they're, they're golden. These guys are golden. And in Hurricane Harvey, we kept cattle in, in isolated spots fed simply because of the National Guard troops that came in. And I told them, we have the bobcat. We can roll that hay in there. And then, now nah, we can get it. We'll roll it in there. So, OK, help yourself. Um, firefighters, this is a grain elevator fire. Uh, it came because of a blizzard, short outs and things. One thing can compound to another thing and your resources that you're counting on for healthcare and stuff could be sucked off because of a different emergency that happens in a disaster. But we're all underwater sometimes, so don't panic. Um, this is from Hurricane Maria in, uh, in Puerto Rico. Um, don't expect this patrolman to get there very fast. He's swimming with swim fins. Uh, so you never, everybody gets impacted. And that's the big bottom line here is that don't panic. There is probably help coming, but they may be impacted by the same event that's impacting you. Uh, that in a lot of the winter storms, we had to identify and find tracked vehicles to go in and dig out haystacks and other things because the, the snow was so deep with mud underneath it to, um, a regular four wheel tractor would not do it. So think about safe spots for your herds, it's something to do. If you have a blizzard, if you have a drought, or if you have a wildfire, think about safe spots. Um, high spots for floods, obviously, uh, fire break areas for wildfire and alternative grazing patches for drought. Uh, buildings and corrals that are fire resistant um, work really well. And in some areas of South Dakota, they have those old munitions depots that are concrete igloos that we would use for shelter and put a pen in front of them and put the cattle in there to fire go right by. And, you know, it's 20 inches of concrete. You know, it's not going to big deal. Not going to touch that. Yeah. So some examples. Um, 1992 uh, at Hurricane Floyd, we didn't have a plan and we lost literally almost 200,000 pigs. Uh, and then we had to figure out how to deal with the mass mortality it was a whole nother presentation. Um, in, uh, in 1997, we didn't have a plan. Uh, Blizzard hit 22 counties in Colorado, five in Kansas and three in Oklahoma in an area that usually has no more than two inches of ground cover. And they only see that once every 11 or 12 years. And we drifted in there with 48 inches of snow and then high winds for about four days, eight to 12 foot drifts. We did lose five people and we lost 38,500 head of cattle. Uh, we fed over a quarter of a million cattle uh, for about a week and a half. Um, turned around and uh, so that was not a big deal. And then when the um, state government said, okay, USDA and the states will help provide some relief you can bury these cattle, but you got to find designated burial sites. And each head of cattle has to be verified by extension and brand inspectors that it's owned by certain people before we can file paperwork. Seven weeks of dragging carcasses off piles and verifying brands. Uh, just an incident goes on forever. It just does. Uh, in uh, 2006, we had no plan when the spotted tail fire came across. Um, and the sheriff asked me to be the branch director for the ag branch. And it took me nine and a half hours to get teams pulled together. Uh, and we lost 500 head of cattle. Then we started planning in 2012, same area, region 23 com fire complex. But we had a plan and we'd practiced it and we talked about it. In 47 minutes after the call came in, we had 18 teams of livestock rescuers on the road and we moved 8,500 head of cattle. 30 miles out from in front of a fire and around edges to alternative pasture. That's a success. Um, and it's all based on local landowners working together. It wasn't just us driving it. It was just the idea that we can do this. We can save each other. And in the same area of 2013, which uh, Jeremiah is aware, we had that storm come in at uh, early, early fall after a hot, dry summer. Uh, livestock were still in summer hair. Everybody was trying to leave them out there as long as they could to get the grass because they had no grass at home. 
and then we had 48 to 96 inches of snow and uh, we lost a lot of a lot of livestock and it took us three weeks to find them all when it melted out and uh, some of them we saved like the one behind Jeremiah that red calf you found them in the middle of nowhere um, for extension people and people who are involved in communities there's another side factor to this and that's about time you get organized and you're working on stuff it becomes a media event um, 39 uh, media interviews during that while we're trying to coordinate other stuff. We had people from as far as Washington, D.C. and New York come out with television crews. And they want they all just want a minute of your time. Well, when you're trying to help the neighbors save everything, that's kind of a, an additional workload. So it happens. Have a plan. And if you have a community plan, have somebody ready to handle those media things. How are we doing on time? We're about, about there, minutes. Scott. We got a few more minutes to okay. wrap up some uh, last minute comments. So Scott, um, just from a personal level, it was driven at home to me yet once again, having wildfire near how important it is to communicate amongst families because oh, yeah. you assume things that your spouse doesn't, ass they assume you know. And so having that discussion on how are we going to get out of here and how are we going to get our livestock out of here is extremely important to have talked about it beforehand, that's, even on small places. Such a great point. And this picture emphasizes that this is why I trained for disaster. These are our six kids. Um, but invariably, for the last 30 years, when the balloon went up, Scott would jump in his truck, turn on lights and sirens, and leave. So when the fire gets close, guess who's taking care of the local home front? Uh, the spouse is dealing with these guys and livestock and all the issues related. So you need to talk to it ahead of time. Uh, um, it's important to think through those things. A um, little humor here that I mentioned earlier, cats are often more dangerous in disasters than horses. Uh, they tend to want to climb your frame, especially if they don't want to know who you are. Um, so I didn't know much about cats. It's like catching skunks for fun. We still but don't know much about cats. Oh, yeah, I told you. <laughs> so do we have any questions? I, I'll drop the next one. It's just my contact information and some websites, including our barnyards and backyards. Um, uh, extensiondisaster.net is the Eden Group, the Extension Disaster Education Network. We have 375 disaster-related educators and specialists from 79 universities that work together to generate these kinds of classes. And you can go on there and search almost any kind of disaster issue. Uh, everything from mold after floods to uh, uh, fairs where a disease breaks out. So uh, I, I would encourage our, our uh, audience members to go out and look at our resources afterwards. Uh, looking through Scott's documentation about uh, go bags or to go bags or those types of things. The bug out bags, whatever you want to call them. Um, it's, a, it's a list of some really good information that uh, some things that you should have ready to go that you can pick up a bag and go. Um, so uh, check that stuff out. Yeah, we had one uh, comment on Facebook, uh, Scott, that, that said, uh, you know, the weed and pest in, in this county, and I don't know which county it is, but had a water trailer parked close to where they had started a fire with a rotary swather. And uh, that was a big help, just having that resource there. It was easy to refill and uh, fire trucks to try and manage that. Um, my thoughts when I was listening to Jenny talk, um, uh, like especially with forest fires, something where you can visibly see it, you can track it on the, the news outlet, right? Where is it at, at what point? Uh, update that plan. That's a good time to have a conversation over dinner of, you know, that fire is moving our direction at what point? point where's that cutoff line of once the fire reaches here we're pulling stuff out right yeah. and, decision, and decision points are great to have especially in your planet but they don't always work um what was it eisenhower said planning is essential but a plan only lasts till a bullet first round goes off um a good example a Heyman fire i was working red zone as a volunteer or a paid firefighter with three red trucks uh we were watching the forest between colorado springs and pueblo and uh, it was just a little grass fire up by Bailey that, or not by Bailey, by uh, above Colorado Springs that started. It was only 400 acres. The four trucks, we got it kind of bedded down. 
we left two trucks there to walk around it all night long and the wind changed. By morning that fire had went 19 miles. Uh, so it only, a good plan has, wor has worked a lot of, worth a lot, but it won't cover everything. You just yeah. have to be ready. Right. Well, and, and knowing when to pack up, right? Uh, when the flames are at the door, that's not the time to start packing. You should have been packing when the flames were ways off, right? And preparations, like you're saying, get those documentations put together, make sure that go bag's ready to go, that kind of stuff. Hindsight, well, hindsight's always 2020, right? Right. Well, knowing what you're going to take at this point, unfortunately, yeah. we've had several trial runs on what we're going to take <laughs> just out of our personal positions. So, so knowing what you valued most becomes so the, real clear. The Laramie area went through the Mullen fire this last year, and, and I used to work that area as law enforcement a lot and loved that area. Um, but the funniest part of it, when it crowded over into Colorado, my counterpart in Colorado called me and said, I don't want your fire. Don't share your fire with me. <laughs> and uh, she already had three going. And, and, and I said, I, well, you know, we're kind of done with it. You can see what you can do with it. You know, we like to share. Crowded, crowded down in and went past the governor's ranch or the past governor's ranch and stuff there. But you never know when stuff's going to happen. It can go from being a county or a city event to multi-county to multi-state to and you don't know what they're dealing with either. So you kind of have to have several sets of resource options and the incident command system is good about that. Uh, the beautiful part is if you as an animal owner talk to your county emergency manager and get familiar with how he op or she operates, you're automatically tied into that huge national resource system. He'll write a note or that person will write a note down and then they may call you and say, look, we've got over on the east side of county, we need to help move some livestock, can you help? Uh, but at the same time, when the balloon goes up around you, you're a known entity. They'll, they'll, they'll respond quicker because they know where you are, what you are, and they have a relationship. When disasters happen, only two things count, contact information and relationships. That's all it is. Uh, so make some. Scott, so it seems like in Wyoming, you know, we use our fairgrounds a lot for holding livestock when disasters break out. If I was a small or uh, acreage landowner and I had a couple horses and stuff, would you advise, like I talked to the fairgrounds manager or my emergency person in the county to kind of figure out what the, what's likely to be the scenario? Well, um, first, let me give you an example. 2006, that big fire in, in Nebraska that hit three counties was two days before fair. So we had a little issue because we were trying to evacuate a third of the landscape into a set of facilities where the animals were already coming in for fair. So plans go sideways and your emergency managers are gonna have alternatives, uh, whether it's a private horse ranch or something like that, or, or they're setting up panels and pens out in another area I'd talk to your emergency manager and uh, you usually can get to them through your fair board and your extension office too, but your emergency manager is in charge. They have the jurisdiction. They're gonna decide where it goes, what, what happens. They may delegate it to Jeff or to Jeremiah if the balloon goes up because they're busy, but they're still under their authority. Um, the county emergency manager decides how the responses happen and how things are done. And so they're great people to get to know. And they have a copy of an emergency plan and they're willing to share that with you. So you can always get a copy of it and say, well, that doesn't say in here. It goes, oh, well, we'll, we'll enhance that a bit. But you can help them enhance those plans and make them realistic. Scott, how do I find out who my emergency manager is in my county? Is there a website, a list? Uh, what, what department are they in? How do I find that if I'm not familiar with them already? Okay, there's several options. You can go to your county government page and they'll be listed there. You can go to the uh, web page for the Wyoming All Office of Homeland Security. And then it'll say local county contacts and it will give you a list of every county emergency manager in the state and their phone number and their email and their office location. In addition, you can do pretty much the same thing in other states. Uh, go to your county, your state emergency management agency and they, they interact with these people all the time to make plans and to improve things. So, but you can do it locally through a county government webpage. If, if there's nothing like that, just call the county 
courthouse and say, how do I get a hold of the county emergency manager? Um, you can go through the state emergency management and, and they'll have a backlog too. Great. Do you see anything else, Jenny, on Facebook or Jeff? I, I don't have anything on my end. I don't see We're anything. Good. All right. Well, we'll just wrap it up. Thank you, Scott. This has been very informative. It's been great. Thank you so much for your time. Nice seeing you guys. Try not to barbecue anything. Okay. Yeah, it's getting warm <laughs> no in here. Kidding. No kidding. Well, and we want to thank our participants. This is why we're doing this is for you. And so thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we want to highlight a few things uh, with these shows. So if you are interested in new shows, right, shows that are coming up, go to our Barnyards and Backyards website. Uh, on that website, we have a great list of, of the shows for this spring. And so you can find out what's coming up next in the, the Zoom link to join if you're able to join us uh, via, via Zoom. Also, shows just like this one. Once we get them finished, we, we brush them up just a little bit. We recorded them and we post that recording back up on that same website. So you can go back and review this one, review others. Scott has provided some great resources. We're going to link those on that website as well with the video. So as, as he was talking about some of those resources that are available, those will be available on that website as well. So go look at that, check it out. Also, while you're there, you can see on the left-hand tab, there's a treasure trove of information. And, and Jenny does a fantastic job of, of populating that with just very relevant topics on, on a wide variety of topics, right? A lot of references, a lot of articles, other resources, other websites. So check it out. It's there for you. That's why we're doing this. Um, Scott said, getting in touch with your local extension office or your local extension educators. We have a, a, an office in every county of the state of Wyoming and one on the Wind River Indian Reservation. And to find that, um, just look that up. Look what your local office is. Get in there, chat with them. Jenny just pulled up the website there. So real easy to find. And then the last thing is, and Jenny's always, always beats me to the punch on this one, but we want to hear from you. We want to hear the feedback. Uh, Jenny has posted our evaluation into the chat box here on Zoom and on the comments and Facebook. Uh, so click on that link. It's very simple, easy evaluation. We want to know how this show was and how other shows are. Please uh, provide that feedback for us so we can uh, target this better for you. So, and with that, that's all I have. Thanks, Jeff, Jenny, Scott. Thanks again. Thanks, Scott. Thank you.